So the topic of today's lecture is beam design. And so before we get into talking specifically about how to design beams, it's probably worthwhile going to review what we might even mean by design uh, when it pertains to uh, what we do as engineers. And so I thought it was worthwhile to go and look for what the definition is of design, engineering design, uh, that is given to us by our accreditation board. So we are accredited by a board called the Accreditation Board for Engineering Technology. And um, this is the definition of engineering design. Engineering design is the process of devising a system, component, or process to meet desired needs. It is a decision-making process, often iterative, in which the basic sciences and mathematics and engineering sciences are applied to convert resources optimally to meet a stated objective. That makes it totally clear, right? Not, maybe not for some, for some of you that's not totally clear. Okay, so I guess the, the part I wanna say like above everything is that design is basically decision making. So I think the most important statement in this whole thing is the one where it says it's a decision making process, okay? So when you make decisions, there's different things you can do. You can select a kind of material something's made out of, right? You can select uh, various sizes of things, right? You can select how the geometry of something is going to be arranged or oriented, right? There's all kinds of decisions that can be made in the process of doing design. And so what we do in engineering is we try to do this in a somewhat uh, you know, systematic way, but it, a lot of times there, there is art to it whenever you're thinking about trying to design something. You have to try to figure out what would I do to solve X, Y, or Z problem. You might come up with an idea, and then what makes you different, what makes uh, you as an engineer different is that when you start approaching it, you have another layer you can go through after you have your big main idea that you have as far as how you can solve your problem. What you can do next actually has to do with this word down here where it says optimally, okay? And that is why we need so much math, okay? Because if we're trying to optimize things, if we're trying to choose the best way of doing X, Y, or Z, then it usually involves us having some idea of what all the possibilities are and then having a, a criteria on which we can decide what is the best, right, that you can choose out of all the different ways to do something. So um, anyway, I thought, you know, this, this definition here uh, is actually pretty meaningful with respect to the uh, example that I'm going to show you today about beam design. There's a few elements of this that are going to show up when we do this beam design. Okay. Uh, let's get into beam design just a little bit, um, at, just in general terms. Um, what, give me some ideas as to what might make one beam better than another beam for a particular, particular application. Okay, so I think you're saying uh, the right size. And why is that a, an important thing to think about it being the right size? Okay, so he says you don't want it to be too small because it might not have enough strength to support what it has to support, but you also don't want it to be too big. What are some reasons why you don't want it to be too big? What is that? Cost would definitely be a factor. Weight would be a factor. The space it might take up might be a factor, right? These are all things that would matter to us with respect to whether or not we chose a good beam. Okay, um, when we talk about whether or not a beam is able to carry the, the load that it has to be able to carry, um, one thing that we've been learning about is how much stress can get induced in the beam, right? Is that what you sort of have in mind when you say, is it going to be adequate to carry the load? Okay, so I would also agree with that. Um, it needs to be able to withstand the load. But that actually can have two different elements to it, right? For it to withstand the load, one is you don't want to uh, overstress it. 
But is there another factor that might matter to us with respect to anything that we are loading? Is there other, are there other ways that, that parts can fail? Like let's say some, you know, is there a way that a part could fail and not exceed some sort of a stress that would cause it to yield or, or fracture? Okay. Someone says there could be some kind of cyclical loading and maybe you could, you know, that might cause it to fracture, but due to, to different type of stress, right? I've got something else in mind. Okay, you could have corrosion. That might be a way it could fail. What would you say? Ah, so it has to be able to withstand its environment, right? So I would actually, you know, write that down. But there's another one that is very much um, related to this class, and it has to do with deformation. Okay? And what we mean by that is this. It's possible for a, a beam to remain elastic, right? It can be not yielding yet, but maybe it would deform too much for the purposes of what we need the, the beam to do. Uh, you might be kind of surprised to realize that uh, the beams that are under the floor that we are standing on right now were probably not primarily designed to withstand the amount of stress that they have to carry. Okay, well, why might that be? Okay, the beams that are under the floor here could probably withstand a lot more stress than we are actually putting on them. And the reason that those beams were chosen as opposed to some other kind of beam is that whoever designed this building did not want this floor to look like a bowl, right? You might be surprised to know that in a lot of buildings, it is actually primarily how much something will deform that controls how big it is made versus how much stress it actually is carrying. All right, but both are sometimes factors for us to think about. I'm gonna give you a little bit of help with respect to what we're doing in here. And we're gonna say, we're primarily going to look at the question of stress in here uh, for our beam design questions. But I wanted to mention this up front that would basically say, there are many applications where you would need to design a beam not necessarily primarily looking at stress, but also looking at other factors, one of which is how much it deforms, all right? The other ones that you all suggested are good too. You know, you want to make sure it'll withstand its environment uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of other questions like that. But, you know, deformation is, is definitely one of those factors. And I'm just going to make a comment here that says, when I uh, propose these problems that we're about to solve, where I'm trying to get you designed for stress, I just want you to realize that that's what we're doing and maybe not addressing the question of deformation quite as much. Okay. All right, so those are some interesting things. Let me actually uh, give you a, one other, one kind of new thing with respect to our formulas, all right? When we had our, our basic uh, maximum stress formula, what did, how did we find this maximum stress in a beam? What's that formula look like? We would find a bending moment, and we would find kind of what that maximum bending moment was, okay? times C, and what was C? Largest distance from the neutral axis uh, of the cross section to the outer fibers of the beam, whether that be to the top or to the bottom uh, of the beam. And then what did we have for the denominator of this? Okay, and it's a special uh, axis around which we have to find that I. It's the neutral axis, okay? So let me show you this. Um, this pair of variables right here, what do those depend on? The shape of the beam, right? You have to look at the cross section of the beam, and both of those values depend on what that shape is of the cross section of the beam. Okay? Well, let me ask you this. Let's say you're a manufacturer who decides you're going to start manufacturing beams. Right? You're going to start selling beams to people, and you're going to um, you know, tell, the, tell the people who you're selling beams to, here is our list of standard beams that we, uh, that we make. Would it be possible for you to basically collapse those two pieces of information, the uh, second moment of area about the neutral axis and this furthest distance from the neutral axis to the outer fibers of the beam? Could you collapse that into one number? And, and what would be an advantage of doing that? 
you basically can have one number that's just a function of just the cross section. And you're making these standard cross sections. So once you make that cross section, you don't necessarily have to have two parameters that you give someone to tell them how to plug into this equation. You can just give them one parameter, right? And this gives rise to a parameter here that we'll call section modulus. Okay, capital letter S is what uh, this text that we use here uses for that section modulus, okay? And how do you think we might define section <coughs> modulus? I'll give you a clue. We want it to uh, be arranged so that as it gets larger, we are talking about stronger and stronger beams. So if we want to define it and we want to encapsulate C and I, how do you think you might define a section modulus? Would you say maybe you would define it as the second moment of area about the neutral axis divided by that maximum distance from the neutral axis to the outer fibers of the beam? Okay, so this is uh, something else that we're defining and it is just purely a function of what the cross section is of the beam and it gives us one number we can look up in let's say a table of different choices for different kinds of beams that we might want to use uh, in a particular application, and we can just look at this one number and compare what beam might be stronger than another. All right? Does that make sense? Because the, if you look at the other factors, right, the stress that is induced as well as the, uh, the, the bending moment there, those don't depend on the cross-section of the, of the beam. So we've gotten everything that has to do with the cross-section, we've, we've boiled it down into one parameter called section modulus, okay? So now, let's say my job was I need to find <clears throat> the minimum section modulus that, uh, you know, that could possibly, you know, meet my needs, um, you know, for a particular application. Would it be possible for me to solve that equation for section modulus? Because basically what this becomes, once I define my section <coughs> modulus as S, is just M max over S. <coughs> Right? But my point I was about to make is, would it be possible for me to solve that equation for S? Right? So could I say S is just equal to uh, M max over what? Okay, over stress. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to propose I actually put in here some alternate subscripts. Because if I'm using this as a design equation, right? Let's say this is, you know, I'm trying to use this in order to design what kind of a section modulus do I need, right? Then I need to think through here, what kind of stress would cause my beam to fail, right? So I could, you know, maybe put in here just a failure, I'll, just in general terms, I could say whatever that stress is that causes it to fail. I will make the note here that when we derived this MC over I equation, it was really only valid for yielding, right? Because it was one of our assumptions we made in the middle of, of deriving all that, that it's only valid for yielding. Having said that, I've seen people use this equation past yielding uh, in certain instances. So, but anyway, we'll just generally say that'd be like a failure stress. And I'm going to put a subscript over here on this, on this S. I'm going to call it SREQ to basically represent a required section modulus that I need to withstand my max and stay within a stress value that would cause failure. That makes sense? Now, here's a question. What if I chose an S value that basically uh, you know, you gave me exactly my, my uh, failure stress, right? I've got a maximum bending moment. I choose an S value that takes me right up to my failure stress. Does that sound like an optimal situation? Okay. What do you think we might be able to do in order to make that? Okay. We might not want a, uh, a factor of safety in there somehow. And if we put a factor of safety in here, where do you think we might want to put it? Okay. We're basically going to want to increase the amount of S value we say we need, right? 
So it probably needs to go in the numerator. Does that make sense? All I'm doing is, you know, one way of looking at this is that your uh, factor of safety is the stress that causes failure divided by your working stress. If you really wanted to chase that through, you could figure out how I got that factor of safety right there so that I was uh, making my S value predict a working stress instead of a failure stress. All right, so that's how that, um, that goes in there. But anyway, this is the equation that I wanted us to think about as a design equation. It allows us to select our, uh, our S value, a required S value, so that we can withstand this maximum bending moment with a factor of safety and not exceed our failure stress. Okay? We ready to do an example problem? Let's do it. This example problem was actually inspired um, by a situation that uh, a good friend of mine encountered in his shop. All right? He basically had this loft. Right? That's what I'm kind of trying to represent over here is this little loft. And he had a workbench underneath that loft, and he was trying to put in a gantry crane system above the top of all this. And if you've ever seen a gantry crane, um, it basically has, these are like little rollers at A and at B up here. So it can move in and out of the page, and you can, you know, pick something up off of the, uh, maybe the floor of the shop or whatever, you can pick that up and uh, that beam right there can suspend it. You can maybe put a trolley of some kind on the beam that can move back and forth, left and right, right? So you could sort of move something anywhere in the, in the shop. But what was tricky is that he had this workbench under the, uh, the loft and he wanted to be able to get stuff over onto that workbench, okay? So what I'm going to say with our first part of this design problem is the first part of a design problem is not so much about optimization. The first part of our design problem is more that artsy type of us trying to think of how would we set up a system to try to pick something up off of the floor of the bay there and get it over onto the workbench from anywhere. Got any ideas? Okay. You want me to propose one? Yeah, okay. What if you set up a trolley on this beam, and so the trolley would have like little rollers on it, kind of on the top and bottom, and this trolley would be set up so that it has an arm that sticks out like this. Okay. Furthermore, um, you could put another trolley on that one, right? And that could be where maybe a winch of some kind was able to pick something up. Okay. Does that solve our issue? You think about this. Our top trolley could go all the way from left to right on that beam, right? Top trolley can move left and right, and we can move just about anywhere. We have a second trolley right here that can move left and right. And it'll go far enough over, now that I've got this little extension, this little leg that goes out to the side, right? It'll go far enough over to where it can go over the top of the workbench, and you can set something large on the workbench that way. Okay? What we just did there is an example of more of the artsy side of design. We came up with an idea, right? We came up with something that, you know, Really, a lot, most of our engineering study won't necessarily teach us how to come up with an interesting idea like that. What does our engineering study do for us? Now, yeah, now that we've had the idea, we can actually try to figure out how to optimize that idea, right? So this is our idea, and what I'd like for us to do, just so we can focus in on a small enough section of this problem that we can get it done, let's optimize the top beam going from A to B. Right? Does that make sense? And we need to make it to where that top beam will not fail regardless of how we have the, um, you know, this crane, like the loads could sort of be anywhere along where they could slide. Right? 
we need to think of what is the worst case scenario of how we could have load on this thing. Okay? How might that happen? Okay? So I probably have the top trolley in about as worst, as, you know, as bad a spot as it can be in terms of stress. Right? Someone said the middle, and I agree. That it looks to me like the worst case scenario is going to be if we have to suspend the weight exactly from the middle of this, of this thing. But that's only one of our variables about where this load might be, have to be carried. What's another possibility? Our weight, or this trolley that I put right here, this could actually end up sliding all the way out there, right? And what does that do? Yeah, not only is it going to have a force downward where the, the top trolley is, it will also apply a moment on the beam where that top trolley is. So it's going to have a downward force as well as a moment applied up there on that top trolley. And uh, we need to be able to design this thing with this sort of extreme, this is what I would identify as being the worst case scenario for what kind of a moment we might generate in that upper beam. Okay? And how much weight do we need to be able to suspend on this thing? So we're basically talking about a 2,000 pound, a one ton load being applied on the end of this thing. And about how long does this arm need to be? Okay. Yeah, we could, we could quibble about whether it needs to be exactly seven or maybe a little longer. Or maybe it doesn't need to be quite seven. I don't know. Let's just say seven. Okay. So we'll say seven feet. in order to make it underneath that loft and, and deliver that load. Okay, so a lot of what we've been talking about right now, we have been discussing our engineering specifications, right? We've been discussing how does this thing need to be set up? What is our goal? What is our, our uh, you know, problem that we are trying to solve? And we are very close to getting this to where it is more like a, um, an engineering problem that comes out of a textbook. Right, so let's let's think about that, and let's um, maybe draw a quick free body diagram of what kind of a load this would imply on beam AB. Okay, so I'm going to start there and draw a free body diagram of beam AB. All right. <clears throat> so what what forces do I have acting on beam AB? All right, I might have a reaction at each end, one at A and one at B, okay? Uh, maybe I'll call this RA and this RB. I'm ignoring left and right forces because it kind of told us we could do that in the uh, problem statement. We're also going to neglect our dynamic effects. Uh, one way of justifying that is to say, well, that's one of the reasons we have our factor of safety, all right? Might be other ways we could justify that too, but Anyway, we'll just say we're going to neglect the, any sort of dynamic effects that might happen on this. Um, okay. What other uh, forces would act on this little segment of beam? Okay. A downward force of the trolley. What would that downward force need to be? Yeah, 2,000 pounds. Okay, if you don't believe me about that, that's okay. What you can do is you can imagine a free body diagram of the little dog leg looking piece. Yeah. Okay, so he's saying, are we going to ignore the self weight of this little uh, element here that we're adding, right? Is that what you're saying? Okay, and I will say, uh, let's use, let's, let's actually take that as another assumption. We'll go ahead and neglect that self weight. If we didn't want to neglect that self weight, what would we need to do? There need to be a little bit more force added with this 2000, depending on how much that weight that thing had, and maybe a little bit more added with respect to this other value that we need to put on here, which is a concentrated moment 
due to the fact that this thing is trying to rotate it clockwise around that location where it's being attached. Okay, um, We'll neglect that um, because I want to get into it with the other one. We won't neglect the self-weight of the beam up there, AB, itself. All right, And that's partly just because I want to uh, focus on the central part of this problem and not get too uh, out in the weeds on trying to come up with exactly what these forces should be. Does that make sense? All right, so this other force or this other moment that I put on there, what's the value? What, what value should that have? Okay, someone says 2,000 pounds times 7 feet, which gives me what? 14,000 foot-pounds. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want us to think, is that going to cause the bending moment to be higher to the left or to the right of where it's applied? Okay. Some of you say probably to the right, and I would agree with that because the effect of just that concentrated moment if that was the only thing we had, it would turn it from frowning on the left to smiling on the right. And so there's going to be an increase in the amount of bending moment. Um, and the 2,000 pound acting right in the middle would have already been making it smile, right? So where we're going to have our worst case scenario for our bending moment is probably going to be just immediately to the right of where that um, concentrated moment and, and concentrated force are being applied. And why do you think I'm, I'm trying to think through that? Like, where might this worst case scenario be for my bending moment? That's right. That's where I need to calculate my bending moment. And if I can't do this by just reasoning it, reasoning it out and figuring out where it must be, then what do I have to do? I've got to actually have to go through the whole shear and bending moment diagram process. But if I can reason it out and figure out where it should be, then I can avoid that and I can do what instead? Okay. Instead of going through a whole shear and bending moment diagram process, I can just make a cut where I know the worst case must be, do one free body diagram, and then I've got my equations for maximum bending moment. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. But. When I make this cut, and I'm going to go immediately to the right of where that uh, concentrated moment is being applied, let's actually imagine doing that real quick and finding the, what that free body diagram might look like. Which side do you think might be easier for me to choose? In other words, when I make the cut right there at that blue line, I can choose doing a free body diagram of the left side or of the right side. All right? I agree the right side is probably more uh, simple for me to think about because if I go immediately to the right of where the uh, these two loads are being applied, then those loads won't show up on my diagram. And the only way that I'll know that they had any effect is basically through the reaction at B. Does that make sense? So I want to do a free body diagram of just the right side. All right. <coughs> And what I will see here is that I'm going to have R sub B right? Um, for my shearing force. If I was going to put a shearing force on here in the positive orientation, what direction should I show it? Downwards, Downwards or upwards? OK. Yeah, Upward. Yeah. So this is to the right, correct? It's a piece to the right. And so if you're talking about a piece to the right, then an upward force would be my positive shear, according to our sign convention we have established. All right. What direction would be a positive bending moment? OK, clockwise for this one. Right, because that's the direction that would make this thing smile. Okay, let me put that over here. All right, excellent. So we've got a couple of steps we need to do to be able to determine what this maximum bending moment. Now, this I know the reason I know this is a maximum bending moment is that I have chosen this location. 
that is 10 feet. This is where, you know, the trolley would be that would cause my maximum bending moment, and my maximum bending moment is going to be just to the right of where that concentrated moment is being applied. Okay? So there's two steps now that I need to do to figure out what that maximum bending moment is. What's the first one you think? Okay. From this free body diagram here, I need to maybe some moments around A. When I do that, what will I have? Okay, this is 10 feet. This is another 10 feet here. Okay, what sorts of things contribute to my moment around A? Times 10 feet, right? Negative 2,000 pounds times 10 feet. What else? Minus 14,000 foot pounds plus RB times 20 feet. This is set equal to zero, and so we can say that RB is going to be equal to 2,000 pounds times 10 feet plus 14,000 foot-pounds over 20 feet. Okay, what does that give me? Okay, 2,000 times 10 plus 14,000 all that divided by 20, all right? 1,700 pounds. And how do I use that? I use that with another equation coming from this diagram, right? What do I do there? I'm going to sum moments around the cut. And I will have RB, which I just found out was 1,700 pounds, times what? Times 10 feet. Then what? Minus M is equal to 0. So what's M? 17,000 foot-pounds. And that is my maximum bending moment. OK? Great. What do you think I'm going to make this material, you know, the, the material of beam AB, what do you think it'll be made out of? if what I'm trying to do is choose an optimal I-beam. Okay. The I-beams that we will typically think about using are, are made out of structural steel. All right. So the, the material is somewhat specified just by saying it's an I-beam unless some other information is given to you that would say, oh, no, this I-beam is actually made out of something else. Right. Standard thing to see them made out of is just a structural steel, okay? So that means that I can figure out how strong the material is, um, you know, that uh, yielding strength of the material, and I know the, the moment that's being applied. What do I need to do with this? Okay, remember our equation we, we kind of put up here? The required section modulus is equal to my maximum bending moment times my factor of safety over the stress that causes failure. Okay? My required section modulus is going to be 17,000 foot pounds, right? 
times what's my factor of safety it said we needed. Okay, two divided by what? Okay, if you don't remember this off the top of your head, we do actually have a table that gives us strength values for these various kinds of materials. So structural steel, 36 KSI is the elastic strength of, of structural steel. All right, so we go back here, plug in 36 KSI. All right, how do I need to maybe work my units out? Okay, probably need to do like a 12 inches per foot up here in the numerator to get that into uh, being inches. Okay, pounds, I've got pounds in the numerator and I've got kips in the denominator. So I need to do something with that too, right? What, would you, what do you want to do with that? Okay, I could, I could take this and say there's a thousand pounds in a kip and put that down there. And what that now does for us is it gets rid of the pounds, the kips, and I'm left with what kind of units? Right? In the denominator, this is kips per square inch, right? So you kind of have a denominator in the denominator, which is like it goes back to the numerator, right? The units on this come out in inches, or excuse me, inches to the third power. Right, because I have inches squared coming from the denominator plus an additional inch that's left over in the numerator, this will end up being in inches to the third power. Okay, so let's go ahead and punch them all in. 17,000 times 2 times 12 divided by 36 times 1,000. Eleven point three three three. Inches to the third power. Okay. Okay, great. Well fine. There's that. What do I do with it? Okay. Yeah, so our uh, our text that we use in this in this class has some tables in the back that give us information about certain beams, right? And one of the things you might notice here, this is a family of beams called wide flange, right? What you might notice here is that uh, up here in the heading, we've got this capital S, that is the section modulus of these various kinds of beams. The beams are named according to what's over where it says designation there, right? That's kind of the name of the beam, the name of that type of cross section, right? And it gives us what these S values are for all these different kinds of beams, okay? The only other thing that I'm going to note before I go down and try to find a beam that's appropriate for what we're doing is be careful to note that the, they have axes, right? So they provide us with this information around the xx axis is this everything in this these three columns right if you wanted to do around the yy axis you could use things in these columns but do a little comparison real quick and look at the section modulus around the xx axis relative to the yy axis which one's bigger what do you think that means like why is that one bigger Yeah, the difference is, if you're taking it around the xx axis, that's basically saying xx axis is going to be like our neutral axis, right? You are implying that the beam is standing upright, okay? Whereas, if you wanted to lay the beam the other way and turn it into more of an H beam instead of an I beam, right? Where it was no longer set up like an I, but instead it was laid on its side like an H and load it in that direction, you have those, in, those pieces of information too right? I don't advise it. That's not our most efficient way to do it because our beam is not as strong that direction, but you at least have the information in case you wanted to do something like that, okay? So all that to say, we're in this column over here, this XX column, and we're looking for something that has a section modulus of what? 
at least 11.333, all right? So we're in this little column right here. Well, look at that, 11.8. Great. So that's a candidate, all right? How do I know if it's a good candidate? What I just figured out by saying this is 11.8, and with my factor of safety of 2, I needed at least 11.333. What I've said is this one's adequate to carry the load. OK? So, but now I need to, maybe there's other choices, right? Like how do I figure out, is this the best one, or is there some other one out there that's, that's better? OK? So one way of looking at it is, well, I, I kind of want one that's close to it because my intuition tells me if I have way too much more, then I'm probably making a heavier beam for no reason. Okay? But I want to I show you something else. We can do a little bit better than that because one of the pieces of information that's in this table is how heavy the beam is, like literally the weight of the beam. But it's a little bit weird if you, if you don't read carefully here. Um, you have to actually go into the footnote. Okay? This, where it has this little star right here at the bottom, it's, the star comes from where up here at the top where it said designation. Right? And it's giving you a clue as to how to read the names of the beams. It says W means a wide flange beam, followed by the nominal depth in inches. What do you think that is? It's approximately how tall the beam is going to be if it's set up like, it, like the XX version, right, where it's set up like an I instead of like an H, right? So that's the depth of it in inches. And then the weight in pounds per foot of length, right? That's how much material it makes that beam up. So if we are trying to be as efficient as possible with material usage and only use as much material as we want, what do we need to be looking at to decide whether a beam is better than another one. Basically, this number right over here, the second number in each of these designations gives us the number of pounds per foot of length. And I'm looking at this one saying we chose a, uh, where was it, 11, yeah, there it is, 11.8, right, inches cubed. Is that a pretty light beam? Okay. 15 pounds per foot of length. Question is, can we look up and down this table and find anything that's lighter that would be adequate to carry the, uh, the load? Not in this table. But guess what? That was the wide flange family of I-beams. This table is the American Standard family of I-beams. They have narrower flanges, right? In an I-beam, the middle part, like the part that go, goes vertical right here, this is called the web of the I-beam. And the top parts that go out to the sides, those are called flanges, right? So this one doesn't have as wide of a flange. They have a slightly different shape to them as well. But this is another you know, type of I-beam that we could consider using. And the problem doesn't specify what kind of I-beam we should use. So this is another table that we need to check. Right? So we go in here and we say we're still looking for that 11.333, right? This column right here, 11.333. The first one I find that would work would be this uh, S7 by 20. Is that a more efficient beam? Okay. How do you know it's not? It's 20 pounds per foot of length as opposed to 15 pounds per foot of length, OK? Um, and up here, you could slide up the table a little bit. You don't find anything, as far as I can tell, going up. There are a few lighter ones going down, but none of them that are actually adequate in terms of that section modulus, right? So we don't have to change our initial thought. Choosing the W, um, what was it, W? W8 by 15, that was a good choice, OK? At least it looks like it, OK? Let's take that back into our problem here and say, uh, maybe, I'm going to write down, maybe 
W8 by 15. What could mess me up on this conclusion, though? Once I choose it, I now have another load that I could evaluate that is actually acting on this beam, right? Because it has self-weight. It has 15 pounds per foot of length of self-weight. So what do I need to change now? Okay, considering self-weight, what I need to do now is take those uh, free body diagrams that I drew up there and change them a little bit. Okay, the way I need to change them is to add this distributed load on there. Okay, of 15 pounds per foot of length. Okay, which will change my reactions. I still, you know, since we're going to neglect the self weight of the little arm thing that we installed on there, I'll still just put uh, 2,000 pounds. And what else? Okay, still, yeah, I still have my 14,000 foot pounds for my concentrated moment right there. Okay, it's still 20 feet long, 10 feet and 10 feet to either side of where the, those loads are applied. Okay. So now how do I figure out R sub B? Okay. If I take all of this distributed load and think about lumping it right at the middle, right, like this, how much distributed load am I talking about? Okay. It'll be 20 feet times 15 pounds per foot, right? 300 pounds. Okay. And I do a sum of moments around A. Okay. So there I'm going to now, um, I can actually, if I want, since the 300 pounds is at the same location as the 2,000 pounds, what can I do there? I just put them together, right? 2,300 pounds times what? Times 10 feet. And did I get my sign correct? I need to put a negative on there, right? Minus 14,000 foot-pounds plus RB times 20 feet. So now what am I going to find my RB value as? Okay. 2,300, whoops, 2,300 <coughs> times 10 plus 14,000. All of that divided by 20. 1,850 pounds. Okay, and what do I do with that? All right, I need to go back and kind of do like I did before. I'm still going to expect that my failure location is not going to be different, right? It's still going to be in the same, my potential failure location, my critical location, so sometimes what you call that, um, is going to be right there to the right of where the concentrated load is being applied. Now I know what this fo force is right here. It's 1,850 pounds. And I will still have my V and my M, just like I identified them before. But now I've got something different. 
What do I need to do different on this one? The distributed load needs to be considered on this little piece too. Okay, and it will still be 15 pounds per foot. Right? And how do I come up with M? Some moments around the cut, that part doesn't change. But now I'm going to have an extra term in here, right? And I didn't put my length on there, 10 feet. <coughs> All right. So what I'll have there is 1850 pounds. All right. Times what? 10 feet. Okay. The 15 pounds per foot is going to cause a force that goes downward right here, right? In the middle of where that's being applied, which is only five feet away from the cut. Right? And the amount of weight that I'm talking about there is just going to be 15 pounds per foot times 10 feet, not 20 feet. Right? And it's going to go clockwise around the cut. Okay, so I'm going to, instead of adding, I'm going to subtract 15 pounds per foot times 10 feet times 5 feet, right? Then what? Minus M equals 0. And so what is M? Okay, it just turns out that it's 1850 times 10 minus 15 times 10 times 5. 17,750 foot pounds. Okay, what do I do with that number? Right? I find an updated required section modulus. Okay? Now I've got 17,750 foot pounds here. Again, my factor safety of two. Again, my uh, conversion factors to get into the correct units there. Down here, I'm still going to put in my 36 KSI yielding strength and my conversion to go to pounds instead of kips. All right. If you believe me, when I punch all this in, it ends up giving me 11.8. 833 inches cubed. You want to just change the factor of safety? Say, we didn't really need two. We're okay a little bit less than two. It'll be fine. Is it within the margin of error? No, we don't cut corners here. We do precision guesswork. Okay. All right. So a lot of you probably have the idea of what, what the proper thing is to do at this point is to go back to the table. Right. This was the beam we thought we had, 11.8. We just figured out that once we figure out our self-weight, it moves us outside of what was acceptable. Okay? Now you look at it and you, you say, man, we might want to bump up to this, uh, you know, over here, one of these other beams. We, we looked at it a second ago, right? Um, 
these S values are the ones right here. 12.1. Okay. Now here's the thing. That one does move from being 15 pounds per foot of length to 20 pounds per foot of length. Okay. Is there a better choice than that? What is it? Look right above it. This beam that is nominally 8 inches tall instead of 7 inches tall is lighter, right? 18.4 pounds per foot of length. And not only is it lighter, it has a higher section modulus. It is both lighter and stronger than the S7 by 20. Usually at this point, someone asks a question. What question do you think people might ask at this point? Why do they make that beam? That's a lot, you know, people ask that question a lot of times when I get to this stage of, of teaching this stuff. Why, why would they make a beam that is weaker and heavier than a beam that is, uh, you know, lighter and stronger? So what do you think? It's, it's shorter. So you, both of you are right. You said space. You said, well, it's shorter, right? Both of you are saying the same thing. Maybe you need one that's not eight inches tall, but it is stronger, right? And it's not as efficient. Do we care about that in our problem? Probably not. If this is going to be a gantry in a shop, you don't care if it's seven inches tall or eight inches tall or any taller than that. You can make it however tall you want, right? So there's no, there's no limit for us as far as how big this thing needs to be height-wise, but there can be applications where maybe there are limitations on how tall uh, the thing can be, and you need a stronger beam, okay? Um, and this actually brings up another good point. Not only do sometimes people have the question of why would they make that weaker and heavier beam, other people ask, well, how would you make a beam that is stronger and lighter simultaneously? What is it that makes it both stronger and lighter at the same time? It's all made out of the same material. Okay. All right. It has to do with where they put the area. Right? If you think about our modulus, not our modulus, our, uh, excuse me, our second moment of area. Okay? Think about the second moment of area. It is in units of inches to the fourth. Right? Why is it units inches to the fourth? Okay. It's factoring in two things. One of them is how much area do you have to carry the load, right? That would contribute an inches squared or a length squared, right? But the other factor is how far is that area away from the neutral axis? And the further you can put it, the more effective it is. And not only that, the further you put it away doesn't get more effective linearly as you get it further and further away it gets more and more effective as the square of how far you put it away. So if you can take your area and space it further away from the neutral axis, then every little bit you can space it further away from the neutral axis, it's effective by the square of how far you can get it away. And that's where having an eight inch tall beam, it's not surprising that you could get a much more efficient usage uh, of the material by making it taller. Yeah, you, yeah, you're putting some of that area, like you're putting the area that's kind of built into these flanges further away from the neutral axis, and that's making it more effective at carrying these bending moments. So that's if the weight is directly on the y-axis, though. But what if the, what the force is on the flange itself, and it starts to bend the beam? Okay, so the question there was all of these things assume that we are putting a downward force right in the middle of these members. Whereas one of the things you could do is put an off-centered load and it could start to twist it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Those kinds of things do need to be thought about. Uh, I'm going to save those for those who want to get into structural steel design because that's one of the things that you'll learn how to do. Um, I also do touch on that a little bit in um, advanced mechanics and materials is what happens when you, when you actually begin to twist structural shapes like this. Um, 
And it is a good question, right? The best way to answer that question at this point is don't do that. I mean, you, you laugh, but there is a lot of times where you say this element, by making it this way, it is strong in this direction. So use it that way, right? And then and you're basically saying don't use it another way. Okay, and uh, we can, even though we can do a little bit of work to try to figure out how resilient they are against twisting and that kind of thing, for now, I'm just going to say, don't use them that way. Okay? All right. So, what do we need to do? We've, we had a long discussion there. I think it was worthwhile. But what do I need to do? Okay. I'm going to pick this S8 by 18.4, which has an S value of 14.4. Okay. <clears throat> okay. S is equal to uh, fourteen point four inches cubed. All right. Now, do you want to go through it again? Do you know what to do if we go through it again? What do we change? We now have to go up in here and say 15 pounds per foot is no longer that. It's 18.4 pounds per foot. Up here, this is no longer 15 pounds per foot. It is 18.4 pounds per foot. Change all that up. It will affect these calculations, right? But not much. Same, same procedure. You just have a slightly different number now. And you get down here, and we come up with a new S value. Okay, That new S value that we come up with is 11.947 inches cubed. Do you know what the other one would have given us? What the other what would have given us? The, uh, 7 by 20. Uh, I don't have that calculated. Um, you know, it would be a little bit more weight, so it would probably need just a little bit higher S value than this, you know, but I don't know whether or not it would have been adequate. I didn't, I didn't check that one. Okay. All right. So my question is, is this our, is this our best beam? Okay. I don't see anything else that's lighter. I'll go back to the reference material. I don't see anything lighter than 18.4 pounds per foot of length that is going to be adequate for this load. You know, this, I can go over to the W table as well. Do you see anything lighter than 18.4 pounds per foot of length that is going to be adequate? Okay. I don't see anything. No, it isn't. So what we're doing is we're, in our mind, we're looking through these various weights of beams. The question was, was it a guessing game? It's not a quick guessing game. We're looking at these different weights of beams, and we basically found um, what the lightest beam was that we thought could carry the weight over here on this table. We found out it had an 11.8 section module, 11.8 inches to the third power. We then put in that... Uh, self-weight, because this was our lightest one that was going to be adequate for that job, put in that uh, self-weight into the thing and figured out, well, it's not actually quite good enough. So then we chose literally the next lightest beam in any of our tables, okay, which was this one right over here, this uh, S8 by 18.4. Plug that one in, found out it is adequate, right? And so now we're, we're comfortable with the fact that we've, at least out of our choices that we have in this table, in these two tables, we've come up with our optimized I-beam for this job. Yeah? Uh, how does this work in relation to like Okay. The question was, if you're doing online homework, what, um, you know, how does this work with respect to that? You just have to read, okay? If it says you have to account for self-weight then you're going to want to do an iterative process, perhaps like this one, where you figure out an initial guess as far as your, what might be an adequate beam, plug in the weight of that, see if it's still adequate after you plug that weight in. And if it's not, you might have to bump up. So they are going to ask about beams, like specific beams? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, so his question is, are they going to ask about these specific beams and these tables? There was one comment I would also make, and it goes back to, again, reading. Make sure you read the question, because occasionally the problems that you have to solve might tell you, choose the best American standard beam for this job. Or it might say, choose the best wide flange beam for this job. Or it might say, just choose the best beam. Right? It might say, choose the best I beam. Okay? Those three things you would handle differently because you're going to specifically look in the tables that encompass what the instructions say to look at. Right? So just read the problem carefully because sometimes, you know, that actually reduces your uh, universe of things you have to look through if you're only looking through one table versus having to look through both tables like we did in here. Yeah. Okay, the question is, is there a way that you can sort of look at it intuitively and decide, I think this is, you know, it looks like I'm so close with my S value that I probably want to bump up to the next one because I'm pretty sure my self weight is going to put me over. And the answer to that is, in practical terms, you can basically just do it that way. Like, in pra like if you're out in the real world designing these things and you end up seeing that you're real close on your S value and you haven't factored your self weight yet, you know, you can basically say, I think that's going to end up bumping me up to this next one. And then, you know, you really should do the calculation still after you do that just to check for adequacy, right? But you can a lot of times avoid going through the formal iterative process if you're pretty sure that it's going to be, you know, going to be bumping you over. Having said that, if you pass, make sure you find the best one. And you're not 100% sure that the self weight is going to bump you over the limit, then you kind of have to go through the iterative process to make sure that you're finding the best one, right? Because sometimes it's, you know, the world of like what you would do out there might be different than what you do in here. And I also like the suggestion that was given earlier of could we just let that eat into our factor of safety a little bit? Right? Well, that's a judgment call, right? Factors of safety are things that engineers establish based on their experience. So if they look at it and they say, I think that's still going to be okay, and based on the experience of the engineer, they, they, they're willing to take the risk of, you know, the added risk of not getting up to that factor of safety of two that they were shooting for, well, that's a judgment call. You can make that judgment call, right? What we do in this class is we're trying to teach you the mechanics of how to do it, right? So there's going to always be a little bit more squishiness when you're out there and it's up to you to decide what do I need to do in a particular um, instance. What you got? We're saying that we needed a um, 2,000 pound sort of winch capacity, right? So it says deliver a payload of 2,000 pounds from anywhere in the bay to the workbench. So that basically means, let's say I've got a 2,000 pound engine sitting on the floor in my shop, and I need to move it over and get it on top of my workbench. So we weren't even adding the weight of the arm piece? We're not, yeah, we said a few seconds ago that we could add in the weight of all that arm piece, and the only difference that it would make is that it might increase the 2,000 pounds we had here and the, and the 14,000 pounds a little bit based on that extra weight. Um, just to not complicate it overly, I decided not to include that. But you certainly could, and it wouldn't change the problem significantly. It certainly wouldn't change it significantly uh, in terms of how you would solve it. It might change the outcome a little bit. OK. All right, we've done part A. Aren't you guys excited? We just finished part A. We chose an optimal I-beam. We figured out it's this. Uh, S8 by 18.4, okay? What we want to do now is uh, we want to evaluate another option, okay? What if we don't use an I-beam and instead we're just going to use a structural steel plate, meaning just a flat piece, right, that has a thickness of an inch and a half. So it's pretty thick, right? Thickness of an inch and a half, and what we're going to do high, we should cut that, right? So we're going to let the height of this thing vary, right? We're going to try to choose what would the uh, height, the best height be. And the, by that, I mean the height that gives us a beam that's adequate to support the load, but the least amount of material, 
Okay? This actually represents another kind of design. What we just did with respect to picking a beam, that is a discrete decision that we make, right? It means you have a discrete number of choices. You have a limited number of choices. You could choose this one, or you could choose this one, or you could choose this one, and you know that your job is to choose whichever one is the best. What we're doing with part B here, we are going to try to solve for a particular dimension that is the best. And so our domain that we can uh, choose within is a continuous domain, not a discrete domain. Does that make sense? You basically can choose any height you want, right? We're going to try to choose the height that will allow us to come up with um, a beam that will work and will yield a, a factor of safety of two. I wasn't just uh, incredibly happy with how the, uh, the way I presented this turned out when we did it in class. And uh, so what I decided to do is redo this last part of this lecture uh, for the video here. Um, so what we need to do is, I guess, start this process by coming down here and just make sure we know what kind of an equation we are shooting to try to, uh, to sort of populate. That's where I'm going to start with this discussion. So uh, we know the uh, flexural stress equation is that stress is equal to bending moment times C, right, which is the furthest distance from the neutral axis of a cross section to the outer fibers over I. And we mentioned this before. You'll notice here I'm kind of reverting back to this MC over I form of this equation because if you imagine this, the I value here for the uh, cross-section that we're talking about with respect to this second part of this problem, that cross-section is uh, just simply going to be a rectangle. So let me draw that over here. And this rectangular cross-section is going to have a width of one and a half. So that's the uh, that's a, a given value in the problem. So you're just going to make that an inch and a half. And what we're supposed to do in this problem is solve for what h we're going to need for this cross section in order to make the beam strong enough. My point with this is that i is fairly easy for us to go into a table and look up what the second moment of area is going to be for a shape uh, that's like this uh, relative to these two dimensions. So that's not too bad. Uh, also, c, if you imagine c, it's just going to be equal to uh, one half of h because if we set up the neutral axis here uh, then h over 2 is how far it is from either the top or the bottom to the neutral axis so rather than use the format of this equation that was stress equal m over s we're going to go back to mc over i because it's fairly easy to know what c and i should be for a rectangular cross section um, one thing, though, that's going to be a little bit tricky here is, you know, think about what the, uh, the uh, free body diagram is going to look like for the overall beam. Actually, let's go ahead and draw it here. Okay. So here is the beam. And just like in our previous steps where we designed the beam around a, an I-beam in mind, we're going to have uh, reactions at each of these locations. I'll call this RA, and over here I'll call this RB. Right? In the middle somewhere, we're going to, actually right in the middle, uh, we're going to have a force of 2,000 pounds still, and a moment, just like we had before, in a clockwise sense due to the fact that uh, this arm sticks out to the right, and the fact that we've got this 2,000 pounds with a 7-foot uh, moment arm, that's going to create this 14,000 foot-pound uh, moment, just like we saw before. Okay, um, and toward the end of our previous part of this problem, uh, we found that there was also this effect that happens of self-weight. And when we solved this problem where we were just trying to sort of pick an I-beam, what we saw there was that we could pick that I-beam and then we would know what the force was or the self-weight was of that I-beam uh, based on the one that we picked. Now, since we're letting H be continuous, this self-weight is going to be a function 
of that height that we choose. And so my point with this is that the bending moment that this beam experiences is partly a function of what this self weight is. And so uh, what I would say here is that instead of just calling this M, this is going to be M as a function of H, right, uh, in this equation up here. And we can figure out what the stress is that's carried in this beam if we can find that M as a function of H C is a function of H, I is also a function of H. What we need to do is find that H based on all those functions so that we hit a particular uh, stress that we say is okay for this beam to carry. So that's actually the other part of this that I'm going to point out is we are going to equate this stress the beam is actually carrying to an allowable stress and an allowable stress is a stress that causes failure for our case, since we're trying to design around not letting the beam yield, we would actually say that this is the yielding strength of the material that composes the beam. But um, we don't want to actually let it get up to that yielding strength because then it's literally on the verge of yielding. So to keep it from getting that high, we divide this stress that causes failure by a factor of safety, right? And that reduces what that stress is that hypothetically we should be able to carry reduces it down so that we're not getting too close to hitting that uh, that stress value so hopefully this gives us a little bit of a map for how we're going to solve the problem most of what we're going to need to do to figure this out is to figure out what this bending moment is as a function of the height of the beam and the reason it varies as the height of the beam obviously is that the volume of material that the beam is made out of changes as the height changes. So what I'd like to do is go back and remember that uh, the distributed load due to self-weight, we called that uh, lowercase w a while back, we found a formula for it. We said it was the density of the material times the acceleration due to gravity times the cross-sectional area. All right, so what we probably need to do is go back into our reference material and go up here for US units and see if we've got a, a number for density of structural steel, which is what we are um, making this thing out of. And we'll notice we don't actually have a literal density. We have what's called a specific weight. And uh, don't want to belabor this too much, but specific weight is related to density, uh, kind of. But instead of giving us a mass per unit of volume, it gives us force due to weight per unit of volume. So when I take this 0.284, um, that is basically takes into account both rho and g in that formula that I wrote just a second ago. So let me remember this number 0.284 and also while I'm here I'm going to remind us that the uh, yielding strength of this material is 36 ksi which is the same thing as 36,000 psi. We'll need that here in just a few minutes. All right so I'm going to try to remember those two numbers maybe write them down over here. Okay. Um, I'll write down that 36 KSI for that failure stress that I'm going to try to find up here um, in this sort of overall equation that I'm going to shoot to use right here. And also, let me write down over here, rho G is the same, uh, that product of rho and G is the same thing as the specific weight and a formula that's sometimes used for specific weight is this gamma, don't confuse it with uh, shearing strain, and it's just gamma times A. So for what we're doing here, we can set up a self-weight as a function of the height of the beam by using that gamma value of 0.284 pounds per cubic inch and multiplying that by the cross-sectional area we can find that cross-sectional area as the product of the width, 1.5 inches, and by the height, which we're just going to let that stay h. Okay. Um, one of the things that's going to happen, since I'm going to have to go through several steps to find this bending moment as a function of the height of the beam, these equations might end up getting kind of messy. So uh, even though I don't always do this, for this problem, I'm going to try to simplify each of my uh, you know, sort of steps of the problem 
as much as I can as I move through and that's going to make it uh, a little cleaner by the end. So let's do this. We'll say this is really going to be equal to 0.284 times 1.5 which that gives me 0.426. Okay, and let's think about the units on that. Since I put a value of inches in here, that's going to knock out one of my inches in inch cubed, so this is now pounds per square inch times h. Okay? Um, I'm going to leave that alone for right now. Let's actually move on and look at this free body diagram that I drew over here for this beam and see, you know, you might remember even before when we solved these problems just a few minutes ago for the I-beams, we started with a free body diagram of the whole beam to find the reaction at B. Then we used that reaction at B in another free body diagram to find the bending moment at the critical location. I'm basically going to follow that same model here. So my first step is to find that reaction at B, but now that reaction at B is going to be a function of this variable H that I'm ultimately trying to solve for uh, as part of my design problem here. Okay, so let me sum moments around point A just as I did for the I-beam problem. Um, and I'm going to have a couple of things there. One is my 2,000 pounds times, I need to add my lengths here, 10 feet and 10 feet. That's the location uh, of the trolley as before that uh, causes my maximum uh, stress situation that I could possibly have in this design problem. All right, so 2,000 pounds times 10 feet. And I need to think about what direction that's going since it's clockwise around point A. I'm going to count this as a negative number. Okay, the next one I want to look at is my 14,000 clockwise moment, concentrated moment. It will also be negative because it's clockwise. But it does not need to be multiplied by any lengths because it's already a concentrated moment. So then, um, uh, the next term that I probably need to think about is my distributed load due to self-weight. All right. So what I'd like to do here is, kind of like I do a lot of times, imagine what would happen if I were to lump that distributed load into a single concentrated load. It would have to be at the middle of where that distributed load would be applied, and the value of that lumped load is going to have to be equal to the distributed load, which I'm going to leave that as WH for right now, clockwise, right? W as a function of h, but I have to multiply by the overall length of the beam to get the value of this lumped load. So I have to multiply that by 20 feet. But since I'm doing a sum of moments, I don't just need to multiply by 20 feet because all I've done so far is just gotten how much this distributed load would be if I lumped it. I need to multiply again by 10 feet because that is the distance from the line of action of my lumped load to the point I'm summing moments around over here on the left end. All right. Um, so onto this equation here, I'm going to add now this reaction at B times its distance of its line of action away from point A, which is 20 feet. Okay. So there is my equation. Um, before I write the next step, which is what I'm, what I'm going to do with the next step, is to try to collect everything and, and write everything in terms of R sub B. Uh, really solve for R sub B is really what I'm trying to do, is get it all by itself. Let me look at this W of H, because I came up with a function for W of H up here, but it's in terms of pounds per square inch. And you'll notice here I'm multiplying that function times essentially feet squared with this 20 and 10 feet, you know, those two terms right there. So in order to make the units work out a little bit cleaner here, let me convert this by multiplying it by, I want to put feet in the denominator and get rid of my inches. And to do that, I basically need to multiply by 12 inches per foot and then square that value. 
Okay. So um, let me take this 0. 0.426 and multiply it by 12 squared. What that gives me is 61.344 pounds per square feet times h. Okay. Put a couple of underlines under that. So now you've seen me uh, probably in other videos. It's pretty easy to collect uh, everything and write all of this as uh, you know solved for r sub b. Because basically I just need to take all of this stuff and imagine moving it to the other side of the equation and then divide by 20 feet. So that's what I'm going to do. R sub b then is going to be equal to, I won't have negative for each of these, I'll instead have positive because I've moved it to the other side of the equation. 2,000 pounds times 10 feet plus 14,000 foot pounds. So let me you know, put all that together. Okay, 2,000 times 10 plus 14,000. That's going to be 34,000 foot pounds. All right. Plus, let me put in here this function I just found 61.344 pounds per feet squared. times h and multiply that by uh, 20 times 10, okay, 20 feet times 10 feet, All right? And then this whole thing I'm going to divide by 20 feet, as I said I would because of the 20 feet over there on r sub b. All right, well, this is basically each term can be divided by 20 feet. So what's interesting there is this 20 feet will actually knock out that uh, 20 feet is one way to look at it. And uh, anyway, I'll go ahead and do these terms. So for R sub B, maybe I'll start with the left one. 34,000 divided by 20 gives me 1,700. All right. And then I'll add uh, 61. 0.344, right, times h times uh, 10. The 20s took care of themselves. So 613.44. Okay. Um, this is actually going to be, if you think about this, this is foot squared. That's going to get knocked out with the feet and the feet, but then I still have one more feet down here. Right, so this is going to be pounds per foot times h. All right, and I'd like to do one more thing to manipulate this, um, and that is if you think about the units of h, uh, h is probably going to come out with a certain number of inches is going to be my best way to measure h for the cross section of this beam, and uh, to make that, you know, do a nice job of canceling the units out in this expression, when I get to that point, let me call this actually 1,700 foot-pounds um, plus, and instead of doing uh, pounds per foot here, I'm going to think about multiplying it, right, to get um, inches in the denominator instead of feet. So I'm going to basically multiply it by a foot per 12 inches, right, or essentially divide by 12 is what I'm doing there. 51.12 All right, this is going to be in pounds per inch and then that's going to be multiplied by h and this is also something I'll kind of underline that because that's going to be very important in the next step of the problem which involves drawing a free body diagram of a portion of the beam Remember that our worst case scenario for bending moment is immediately to the right of where the concentrated force due to the trolley and the concentrated moment due to the trolley are being applied, like literally immediately to the right of that point. Which means when I draw a free body diagram of that, 
what I want to do is draw it you know if I if I choose a portion that's to the right of that cut it will eliminate the concentrated force due to the trolley and the concentrated moment due to the trolley from my equations and all I'll need to think about is my r sub b value that I just found a function for it's, remember it's a function of h so maybe I'll call it that r sub b is a function of h um, I will have to put uh, according to positive sign convention uh, my shear force and my bending moment that act on this face where I made the cut okay and keep in mind that is at 10 feet to the cut relative to the right end of the beam and uh, I also want to think about the fact that I can't neglect the concentrated excuse me, not concentrated, distributed uh, load due to self-weight, okay? And that distributed load due to self-weight is still going to just be, according to this equation up here, 61, I'm going to write this over to the side a little more, 61.344 pounds per foot squared H, okay? And one of the reasons I wanted to write that over to the side is a lot of times we immediately think about trying to lump one of these distributed loads into a single concentrated load at the middle of where it's being applied. When we do that, the line of action of that force is going to be five feet away from the cut, right? And the value of the concentrated force that replaces the distributed force due to self-weight is just going to be equal to the distributed force times 10 feet. So we'll put that into equation now. So the equation we want to think about using for this free body diagram is that a sum of moments around the cut is going to be equal to, I'm going to start with uh, maybe R sub B over here. We found it was 1,700 foot-pounds plus 51.12 pounds per inch h, right? That's how much force is being applied out at the end of the beam. But since this is a moment equation, I need to multiply this by its length away from that cut, which is 10 feet. Okay. All right, so the next step um, here after I've come up with that one is I need to think about what do I do with this lumped um, load due to the distributed load due to self-weight. It's going to be a clockwise contribution. So I'm going to subtract, right? The amount of lumped load there is going to be equal to the distributed load, which is 61.344 pounds per foot squared H times 10 feet, right? That gives me the amount of concentrated load there for the lumping. And then I need to multiply that by 5 feet to give me that moment value uh, around the cut, OK? And I only have one other thing that I need to include on here, uh, and that is the clockwise moment that I identified there at the cut. So I say minus m equals 0. OK? And I think that takes care of all of my moments around the cut for that body. What I'd like to do here is solve this for m, right? And really, let me call it this. Let me say this is actually m as a function of h, just like I said it was going to be up here. This is going to be a function of h, and so I'll label it that way here in this um, in this step. All right. Um, I think I noticed uh, an error that I made up here just a second ago. R sub b should not be in sub in foot pounds. <laughs> so let me actually fix that. Um, some of you probably saw that right there at the beginning. I was just moving on along and uh, 
should have looked at that a little bit more critically. All right, I knew something was was about to not work out with my units here, so this is a, a good opportunity for me to remind you if you spend some time looking at your units, it can help you avoid having certain errors. All right, that helps me out a pretty good bit. Um, all right, so I need to now collect this stuff. I end up with 1,700 uh, pounds plus 51.12 pound per inch times h. And uh, another thing I want to do here is, if you think about this equation we're shooting for, we're probably going to be in inches for our strength values. We'll have inches for i and c. If I end up with a moment in foot pounds or with any sort of feet in it, it's probably going to mess with that formula. And one way that I can avoid that down here right now is to just imagine um, and, and actually complete multiplying this by a value that will get rid of my feet and put inches right on this term right here. So I'm going to multiply by 12 inches per foot, which will let me put in 120 inches right here instead of 10 feet. Okay. Um, for this other term over here, you'll notice that the foot here and the foot here actually cancel the foot squared down there, right? So what I'm left with here is minus, okay, 61, let me actually do this calculation, 61.344 times 10 times 5. This gives me 3,000. 67.2 right, pounds times H. Okay, and this all put together is my bending moment as a function of H. Okay, well, what do I do with that? Um, well, what I need to do is now plug it into the rest of my equation. Um, that I identified up there at the beginning, right? 36 KSI is 36,000 PSI. I divide this by a factor of safety, which we said earlier in the problem, uh, that was two. We're gonna set this equal to this moment as a function of H, okay? 1,700 pounds plus 51.12 pounds per inch, right, times 120 inches. Oh, and I missed my H in there. Okay. <clears throat> Minus 3,067.2 pounds times H, right? I'm going to take all of that and multiply it by C. Remember, MC over I, and we had this discussion a second ago, but you might remember uh, the C in this MC over I is just going to be half of the overall height of this rectangular cross section. Right, so I just put in h over 2. In the denominator, I need to put in an expression for the second moment of area of the cross section. The cross section has a base width of 1.5 inches, right, and a height of what we're about to try to find. So we need to leave that in terms of the variable. Uh, a lot of you might know this one by now. Uh, we did derive it in class at one point, uh, but the equation for the second moment of area of a rectangle around its own centroidal axis is going to be equal to the base width times the height cubed over 12. So I'm going to put that in right here. 1.5 inch times h cubed, right? over 12. 
and that 12 is not converting inches to feet or anything like that. It's just part of that second moment of area formula. What we have here now is a, an equation all in terms of one variable, h, 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 h. This would be a little bit of a pain for us to try to manipulate manually and solve for each of those, you know, solve it down for h and try to find it that way. But the good news is uh, we have some nice tools at our disposal here, uh, like this calculator, and we can just enter this equation just as it is into this calculator. 36,000 divided by 2 is equal to another fraction here, All right? 1700 plus 51.12 times, I can't put in h, but I can put in x, so that's what I'm going to put in for my variable, right, times 120 minus 3067.2 times x. Okay, close that parenthesis and multiply all this by x over 2. Okay, that's that term over there. Now down here, let me put in another fraction, 1.5 times x cubed over 12. All right, so I put all of that stuff in there, and we don't hit equals at this point, we hit the solve above the calc key. When I do this, it starts out by telling me, here's what I'm going to use. This is what the calculator is saying. The calculator says, I'm going to use 9.2454 for my initial guess. Is that okay with you? And uh, it, it'll work out. I can go ahead and leave that alone there. So I can now hit equals. Um, sometimes you might have to try to use a closer initial guess if you've got a nonlinear equation. So that's why they let you try a different initial guess there for the Newton's method that's going on inside of the calculator. Anyway, what we come out with here for h is 7.082 inches. Okay, and so that's what we were supposed to find. So the what we would cut to make this beam uh, have enough strength flexurally would be a 7.082 inch tall uh, piece of, of metal. Okay, Now, what I'd like for us to do is actually think about um, is this an efficient way to do our carrying of this load relative to the I-beam we found before? So the way that I would uh, suggest we do that is to find the weight of both of these options. Um, weight, which I'll just abbreviate that with WT, is just equal to the distributed load, which that's a function of h for our problem here, right? Times the length of the beam, and our beam was 20 feet long. Okay, so if we can, now that we know h, right, we can plug in our h value into this w of h function, 61.344 pounds per feet, foot squared. Right, times h, now we know an h, 7.082 inches, right, times 20 feet. Okay, and when we punch these in, all right, let's do 61.344 times 7.082 times 20. Okay, I missed one thing here, and I should have uh, should have noticed it. I can't get rid of this foot squared with an inches and a foot, right? So I'm going to need to multiply this by one other thing. Um, okay, I need to get rid of these inches that I have right here. So I'm going to need to put a 12 inches down here like this, and a foot up here like this. The net result of that is that whatever the calculation was I did before here, I basically need to divide it by 12. Okay, and that gives me 724 
pounds. Okay, well, let's see if that's heavy relative to the I-beam that we found was the lightest I-beam that we could you know, use to carry this load a minute ago. With that I-beam we found a, a little while ago, um, that weight was 18.4 pounds per foot of length. So for this one, our weight is going to be equal to that 18.4 pounds per foot of length times the amount of length that we have. Okay, and that just gives me 368 uh, pounds. So what we find there, the I-beam is a lot more efficient in terms of material usage at carrying the load that we defined in the first part of this problem, right? Being able to, to withstand this load and not uh, experience too much flexural stress. Let me talk about why for just a few minutes. You know, 368 pounds as opposed to 724 pounds. Think about the formula that we use for second moment of area, right? Integral, which is just a, like a fancy sum over a, an infinite number of pieces that you're summing over, of y squared dA, okay? The y squared refers to how far a little bit of area is away from the neutral axis of a cross section. So let me kind of sketch a uh, an eye shape right here versus a rectangular shape, right? So think about for all the little bits of area that compose an eye shape, what you're doing is you're trying to put a larger percentage of those little bits of area that compose the shape, you're trying to make sure that you're spacing those further away from the neutral axis, right? And by doing that, you can reduce the amount of area that you, you can think of it two ways. You can think of it as reducing the amount of area that you need to carry the load by chopping this less effective area out of the middle of the beam and maybe if you have to include more area because um, that's what each of these little bits talks about each of those is a bit of an area if you take that area and you try to make it further away from the neutral axis you're going to do a better job of carrying the bending moment um, at least according to our MC over I equation right you'll be able to by increasing I you'll decrease stress and that means that you're doing a better job of carrying this load. As opposed to a plain rectangle here, you'll notice that we have a lot of little bits of area that are not very far away from the neutral axis. Right? And because we have a lot of these little bits of area not very far away from the neutral axis, each of those little bits of area is uh, contributing to the weight of the beam, but it's not contributing very much to the resistance of the beam to this flexure, right? So the rectangle is a much less efficient shape for us to be able to carry flexure than taking the, and you know, sort of chopping the area out of the middle and if we have to add more area to the flanges of the beam which are further away from the neutral axis. So that's why we're so much better at carrying this load with less weight um, with the, uh, the I-beam relative to this rectangle. And then finally, one last thing that I want to comment on, um, and this is sort of a, you know, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, if you're thinking about putting one of these beams in your shop to be able to do a gantry crane, I'm going to advise you to actually have um, an engineer, not that I'm not an engineer, but have an engineer look at your um, particular scenario you're thinking about doing and make sure that it's going to be okay. So don't necessarily just apply this directly. I'm doing this video for educational purposes, not necessarily for a, uh, a design that you should take to the bank or take to uh, somewhere else. Here's one of the, let me show you one issue that kind of feeds into questions like this. Um, we took care of uh, making sure that the beam is not experiencing too much flexural stress. That's all we really accomplished with this discussion. 
And what I'd like to do is show you one thing that uh, was not sort of contemplated in the formula mc over i. With mc over i, we assume that all of the material of the beam would have no reason to move out of its the, the plane that it sits in originally. So where we have it set up and we put a load on it, there, there's no reason we would assume that the beam would want to go out of plane. But those of us who've played with this kind of thing before realize that if I apply a bending moment, let me turn it on its side here so we can see this, if I apply a bending moment with this hand here and this hand here to a rectangular cross section of a beam, right, and I start to twist this way and this way with my hands, what we'll notice is that the beam actually does try to start flexing out of plane, right? What's happening there is there's one side of the beam that has compressive stress in it, and anything that has compressive stress in it, one of the uh, things that it can do is buckle. And so we see some local buckling. If you try to flex a beam like this, you see some local buckling going on there. And if you don't do something to support that buckling, then that could be another mode of failure that MC over I doesn't subsume. So. Um, all this to say, just be careful. Um, I'm trying to uh, do the best I can as an educator to show some of the uh, things that have to be thought about in these problems and uh, think about them in terms of a design problem, but there are many times other issues that can pop up, and so it's a good idea always to have a professional engineer look at your particular problem before they, you, know, you sign off on a situation where you know, failure of a, uh, a system like this, if you're, ho if you're hoisting heavy objects above the ground, you could actually seriously injure someone if something fell. So anyway, just uh, make sure you have someone look at your particular situation before uh, actually putting it into service. That's about all I've got. I uh, appreciate that you were watching and, uh, you know, subscribe, like, comment, share, all that good stuff. Um, I hope that you've appreciated this and I uh, hope to see you on the next video.